Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. It's a pleasure to welcome Rabbi Daron Perez to our conversation today. And I have to explain, it's a little unusual today because I forgot that Israel has already changed its time. And I told him what time to join us, which would have been in an hour from now. So fortunately for technology, Rabbi Perez is able to take this conversation from his car driving home. Uh, and uh, he is driving, I assume right now, from uh, Yerushalayim to Yad Binyam. <laughs> so just as a word of introduction to Rabbi Perez, Rabbi Perez has served as the head of World Mizrahi for six years. I remember the very first time I met him, it was in the lobby of the Hotel of the Renaissance. And I was told here is a superstar <laughs> who was going to be coming to take over the Mizrahi. He was coming from Shlichut in South Africa. And everything that I was told about Rabbi Perez is true. He's a superstar. He <laughs> has transformed World Mizrahi, brought together people from 20 different countries on behalf of religious Zionism. And with that introduction, it's my pleasure to welcome Rabbi Perez to the conversation <laughs> as the traffic drives by in the window at the same time. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi, for joining us. And I think I may have just lost him. A pleasure. Years. Thank you so much for joining us, Rabbi. No, we good. Are we back? Um, no, no, Paris, it's fine. We're coming off of the... <laughs> we're, it's we're an absolute... Off, uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's a... It's an absolute pleasure. And again, I apologize that I've obviously stopped my car. I'm not driving while I'm speaking, obviously. And I'm, in the, I'm on the highway here. So uh, enjoy the Israeli, uh, Israeli uh, traffic. Um, and apologies uh, for being in the car, but uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be with you. And it's my fault. So it's okay. <laughs> okay. And by the way, it's very safe. You don't even have to wear a seatbelt at this time while you're stacked on the side. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off my seatbelt. Oh, we now we're getting fancy. <laughs> so Rabbi Perez, um, we just came off last week of the World Zionist Congress. And Mizrahi did amazing things, which we're still trying to get the word out about. In fact, uh, today, I don't know if you've seen yet, the far left anti-Zionist portion of the World Zionist Congress um, celebrated how they stopped all the right-wingers from taking over the Zionist enterprise. Kenneth Bob was the one who put this word out. And um, I'm just curious if you can give us a, a very brief overview of what happened this past week, how Mizrahi really made a difference. Sure. I think first it's an honor to be in this dialogue with you, Rav Lenny, and we greatly appreciate not only the role, obviously, that you are playing on an ongoing basis in Chicago, both in terms of your shul, synagogue, community, school, but in, in terms of your national leadership positions, and of course now as the co-president of the uh, RZA, and also on our World Mizrahi board, and we look forward to Bezrat Hashem, uh, many, many, many years of partnership like Dil Torah and Torah Teresh Yisrael the Hadira, and it's an honor and privilege for me part of the conversation. Thank you. I think we're living in historic times. <laughs> I think we're living in in historic times, as we know. This this whole twentieth and twenty first century is just a, a Jewish history moving forward at such a pace with the state of Israel and. And, and the things happening in the Jewish world are quite remarkable in the pace that they're happening. But one of those miracles is the World Zionist Congress. Because to have certainly that, you know, the first time that I can recall, I don't know if it's been at all, but that within the Zionist movement, people overtly identifying as Zionists, wanting to be part of the Zionist movement, are people on the extreme left who are in many ways either overtly or covertly supportive of, you know, BDS and you know, delegitimize the delegitimized campaign against Israel and see themselves as Zionists as being, you know, overly critical from within, all the way to, uh, you know, the, the joining of Eretz HaKodesh, who in this campaign in Israel have partnered with the sort of Haredi sort of Degla Torah parties. And it's quite unbelievable that people sitting around the table for the first time are people from, you know, from different sides of the political and religious spectrum is quite remarkable in and of itself, I have to say. That's number one. Number two, I think the role of Mizrahi in these institutions has never, ever been more relevant as it played out in, in, in these discussions. I know that Kenneth Bob and others have portrayed things in a particular way and have said, had it not, yeah, would it not have been for their influence, there would have been a, a right wing takeover. I can tell you for sure that that is not the case. I can tell you for sure from inside the room, I can tell you that the people 
who were all, there was always going to be a wall to wall agreement. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar, but in the World Zionist Congress, there's always a agreement of all of the different parties. Nobody takes over and nobody runs roughshod over anybody else. That doesn't happen. It's not like <coughs> forgive me, in uh, the American elections or the Israeli elections that whoever wins, certainly in Israel where there isn't, where there isn't a Congress and a Senate, and you don't have the division of the Senate's in this party's hands has the majority, but the president's from that party in Israel, <coughs> forgive me, <clears throat> you vote for parties and not individuals. And in Israel, if you have 61 out of the 120 Knesset seats, you indeed can um, form a narrow left-wing or or narrow right-wing government and exclude everyone else from any ministerial positions. That's not the case in the Zionist Congress. The, the gentleman's agreement in the Zionist Congress is that everybody receives positions of influence according to their relative strength and position. So it was always going to be an ag agreement from wall to wall. Yes, there was politicking this way or that way and people putting a bit more pressure this way or that way. might have secured one extra position this way or that way, but it was always going to be that way. And I can tell you for sure that the, the Mizrahi movement negotiating team led by our senior representative in the national institutions, Avram Duvdevani Duvdev, and nobody knows these institutions better than him. He is the senior representative in these institutions of all the parties. He has been head of the World Zionist Organization for the last 10 years, and he's now moving into the major position of, of Karen Kayemet, but I can say, the chairmanship of Karen Kayemet, that his role and the role of our negotiating team was always to ensure a fair and equitable um, division of the power based on everyone's relative strength. And that was always, always the position um, uh, from, from, from the word go. It is true that something has changed in the World Zionist Congress. This is the first time ever that the political and religious right, either orthodox um, movements from orthodox to ultra-orthodox, and also the right-wing Likud and the other right-wing uh, political movements have for the first time the majority of delegates in the World Zionist Congress. That's never been before. This has always been a bastion more of, you know, the, the leadership has always been center-left. That is significant. I personally feel this is not that different from what happened in Israeli politics in 1977 when Begin came into power. And it was well known that the heading at the time of all the newspapers was, in fact, Chaim Yavin, the famous news reader, began the news, uh, his, uh, he began the news commentary with the famous words of Mahapach, there has been a transformation, there's been a revolution. After 30 years of Mapai leadership and later leadership, but amazingly, after 30 years, the leadership of the country was now in the hand of a revisionist of the right, bringing more traditional voices in. And I believe a similar thing has happened. So yeah, there has been a shift in the Zionist movement, which is very interesting. And secondly, uh, and that in and of itself is an interesting um, uh, shift, but uh, number one and number two, Mizrahi's role, I think is more important now than ever. I'll just remind everybody that when Rabbi Yitzhak Yaakov Reines founded the Zionist, uh, founded the Mizrahi, movement as part of the Zionist uh, movement in, in 1902, Herzl, of course, Zionist movement, and the, many of the religious Jews who were part of this movement felt a need to create their own faction or federation with the mission of the world of Zionist movement, allow for factions to be independent but part of the movement. And when Mizrahi was founded, its founders called it Mizrahi to function as, as a, an acronym for Merkaz Ruhani, to be a spiritual center, to be at the center and bringing spirituality and bringing together to be a bridge. And that I think is a, is, is, is a major achievement. So I think being a bridge and also I can chat uh, also about the, the major achievements in terms of chairmanship of Karen K. Middle Israel, which is an unbelievable, albeit for two years, but Duvdev will be in that position as a very influential position let and various actually, other me, positions. Let me of stop you for a minute. Go ahead. And for those sure. who are not as initiated in the World Zionist Organization in general, the Congress had representatives from all over the world. And the outcome is there are four major institutions really that are affiliated with this decision. There is the Karen Ayasod, which is the funding, the, the Israel Appeal, the Joint Israel Appeal. There is Karen Kayemet, which in the United States we refer to as the Jewish National Fund, the JNF. There's the Jewish Agency, and there's the World Zionist Organization. And of those positions, 
two of the major positions for the very first time are under the leadership of observant Jews. The Likud, who's taking over as the head of the World Zionist Organization, is headed by a person who is observant. And Karen Kayemet Yisrael, which Avram Duvdevani, who is affectionately referred to as Duvdev, is for the very first time have a person with a kippah leading that organization. And so this Congress had some significant impact. And when we talked about before the elections of the hundreds of millions of dollars that was at stake, it was not only at stake, but there have been some significant pieces where the Mizrahi has a new role in the world. And uh, Rabbi Perez is the head of that Mizrahi that has that new role. So coming out of it, we're a week out, um, we're seeing all the, the spin taking place. Even during the Congress, there were these uh, articles that were coming out of uh, Jerusalem Post and other sources talking about the right-wing takeover. It hasn't really been a full takeover, if I understand you correctly. It's been a, there is, as someone wrote, the vote, the, the votes were in, and so there is a leadership from Mizrahi, but Mizrahi bridged. How did, how did you see that? You were in the room during those quiet, private negotiations that took place for about 30 hours face-to-face. -face. Uh, Rabbi Paris didn't yeah. sleep much. What was going on yeah. in that room? First, it was not quiet. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it was not quiet. And there were lots of sub-meetings as well. And again, we were very blessed to have Avram Duvdevani, who is who is so experienced at this and, and, and was seen as in many ways as the senior statesman, ensuring that things are not pulled to extremes and are pulled together. And I think the challenge in that room of Lenny was the following thing. There is a certain reality. Things have shifted to the right. And this is not easy for people to come to terms with. And I think the issue of things that shifted to the right, but also the right and this is how it works in the national institutions, should not be able to overreach. And therefore, part of the, part of the, the challenges was, okay, there, there is a shift to the center-right, and that needs to be reflected in the different positions. But has there been too much of an overreach? For instance, as you correctly said, is it fair, I'll tell you one of the issues that came up, which was a, you know, a major issue, is it fair that two of the major, these four major organizations, the chairmanship of Karen Kayemet and the World Zionist Organization should both be under right-wing leadership, meaning uh, Mizrahi and Likud are sharing the chairmanship of the Karen Kayemet over the next five years. And Likud has got the chairmanship of the World Zionist Organization. Is that fair? There was a huge debate regarding that. So the was one second the jewish agency for israel jaffe is the major positions and that is not contest just by the way the jewish agency's chairmanship was not one of those positions being offered now because the jewish agency has a measure of independence it is connected to the world zionist organization but it's also got a measure of independence it's not fully controlled by the world zionist organization by the way the two organizations which are fully under the governance and control of the World Zionist Organization are the World Zionist Organization and Karen Kayemet Israel. Those two uh, are a hundred percent ownership, so to speak, of those two organizations are the delegates, the WZO. So those two are up for grabs. The other two, which, which run on a slightly different uh, sort of um, time frame, because the World Zionist Organization has a 50% stake in those, and therefore there's a measure of independence for those, was the Jewish agency. So when the right wing came along and said, hang on, but, but the left has the, the head of the Jewish agency. They said, no, that doesn't count. That doesn't count because that's not part of the cycle. Hang on, but what do you mean it doesn't count? That's a major position. So they started, they, they, like all things, there starts being a negotiation, well, what counts and what doesn't count? Then they started becoming a huge debate over Karen Hayasod. So Karen Hayasod, the chairmanship of Karen Hayasod, which is currently in the Likud hands, was given to, to be handed over to Kahol Lavan from the left. But how long would that take? Because traditionally, the, the, the Rosh Memshala, the prime minister, puts forward a candidate for the Karen Hayasod. They said, hang on, if the, if the Rosh Memshala, who happens to be of the Likud, is able to put forward a candidate, then that leads three out of the four organizations uh, are in the right wing hands. I said, okay. So the idea was to try to reach some type of arrangement that the, the Prime Minister could put forward candidates, but only 
within the next number of months. And then thereafter, it would go to Kahol Avan, etc. So these are the type of things that were being debated. And also, Rabbi Lenny, every, every position was looked at and tried to put weight and you know, what's reasonable and what's reasonable. So that's, re by the way, new positions were created. There is a position called the president of the World Zionist Organization, which existed in theory, but not in practice. So that was given to the left wing. So you start having, not dissimilar to the Israeli government, that in order to create a, a national unity government, they had it create new, new ministries and new positions and, 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 and uh, rotating prime ministers. So these ideas were here as well. As, as I said, the Kiran Kayemet is rotating and a, a number of other positions there to rotate in order to keep the balance. Well, so this is a, a great accomplishment. It is something that I know you, you were working on for mm -hmm. over a year to bring this about. And I, get, and I guess what's really so um, heartwarming is the fact that Mizrahi had a role in trying to keep everyone together, that it always is unity. And despite posturing that may have taken place or posturing before, during, or after, the Mizrahi has been across the board trying to work things out with everybody else. It's actually one of the hardest things I, I think that we have of uh, trying to portray. It's much easier to portray, I'm fighting on the right or I'm fighting on the left versus I'm trying to keep everyone together. But if we can shift gears away from the Zionist Congress, because now we have another five years till the next one, Mizrahi, has been doing some amazing things. In our shul, we receive on a regular basis the Hamizrahi, the booklets with, with the Vrei Torah and from across the spectrum. We receive there, we used to be every Yom Atzmut, we had a speaker coming and the, it wasn't just a KINS, it was around the, wor around the world there were speakers going out for Yom Atzmut. There's the Tzurvam and Rabbanan, which are booklets to learn. Where do you see Mizrahi headed in the next five years. What do you see as the major impact that we as religious Zionists should be considering? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I think first and foremost for me, it's about galvanizing in every community and country around the world, all those people who see themselves as passionate religious Zionists, where commitment to Jewish identity and to halakha and to Torah, and at the same time, a deep commitment to Israel, the dual values of Torah and Eretz Israel, the people who see that Torah and the, and the commitment to the land and state of Israel, the people who those values are dear, is to try and galvanize them together and, and try and heighten the impact of the values of religious Zionism. Now we can obviously debate what those values are and I've got my own ideas and all types of ideas. But for me, I believe very, very strongly that life is all about people. If you have the right people, I, I often quote the, uh, you know, the famous business uh, bestseller from Good to Great of Jim Collins. One of the fa what, amazing ideas he shares in this line and in his book is, you know, in life, you've got to bring the right people onto the bus first. Just bring the right people together and then work out where you want to go. Because if you try to work out where you want to go and you don't have the right people part of the conversation, then you don't always work out exactly where you need to be going. So for me, it's first and foremost in country by country. You mentioned 20 countries, which we are reinvigorating Mizrahi. And I'm also thrilled with the direction, obviously thrilled with the RZA and the involvement, your involvement and so many other competent people and bringing on Rabbi Ari Rokov, which is a great achievement, a real well-known national community builder and leader, why you owe you and now RZA, which is an unbelievable achievement. It's all about the people. When there's the right professional leadership, the right lay leadership in every country, in, at World Mizrahi, in all the different countries, then I believe we can have a genuine conversation of really where we should be going. And I think we all, what we're trying to do, obviously, is heighten the impact in every corner of the globe, wherever there are Jews. And by the way, arguably where there are non-Jews as well. You know, there's, there's a big question today. What should be our impact in the non-Jewish world, the evangelical world? We at Mizrahi have not yet taken a stance on that. There are many people who are their whole Zionism is active in the non-Jewish community. So at Mizrahi, we haven't yet dealt with that sugya, but that's a sugya, you know, that's a sugya. What about Zionism in the non-Jewish world and in the Christian world, which is a question, but even just within the Jewish world, where first and foremost, we are, we are involved. It's getting all the active, passionate religious Zionists in every community together, making each individual national and citywide movement with the right people. And then all of us working out together where it is we should be going. I've got lots of ideas. I can share those ideas, but I think the idea is the right people sitting around the table and trying to work out how can religious Zionism in the next 
year five, 10 and 20 years be a very relevant and transformative force in world Jewry. So but there are, um, how do we sell Zionism to people who say, wait a second, the state of Israel was declared in 1948. We've had a state for 72 years. What do we need a Zionist, a religious Zionist, either move to Israel or don't call yourself a Zionist, the Ben Gurion line. How do you respond to that? So I think I think one of the I don't want to say that uh, I don't want to say I don't want to be critical of what's happened before, but I just you know just in terms of going forward, I think to 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 delegitimize and say you know it's called Shilata Gola and say Jews who are living in the in the Gola are not Zionists because they haven't made Aliyah is a very shallow uh, description of a very complex process. It's Parshat Lech Lecha. We all know what an unbelievable challenge it was for Abraham Avinu. Even hearing Hashem's voice, when Hashem says to him, unbelievable challenges. There's only two Lech Lechas, Lech Lecha Me'atzacha and Lech Lecha Lahara Moria of, of the Akeda. Those are the only two Lashon of Lech Lecha in these, in these Nisyonot, and they're incredible Nisyonot. So it's not, we, we all know it's not as simple as waking up one morning and putting on tzitzit or davening and saying, okay, I'm doing a mitzvah. It's, it's a total transformation, and therefore, I believe, and, and what we're trying to inculcate at Mizrahi, that Zionism is not a zero-sum game. It's not that if you pick up and leave, you're a Zionist, and if you don't pick up and leave, you're not a Zionist. Where are you in the question and in, this, in the quest to have Israel such a central part of our Jewish identity? Yes, one should be striving to live in Israel, and yes, please God, one day, you know, we'll all be there. Uh, but that's a process. That's a process. And I think uh, Jews living around the world, have, uh, have an unbelievable role to play, a Zionist role to play in inculcating Zionist values in striving to move to, to Israel, but at the same time wanting to be um, people of influence and impact in their communities. If all of the Zionists make Aliyah, then who's going to head up uh, Kin Shul and who's going to head up, uh, who's going to head up uh, the, the, the Shul and who's going to head up uh, all the different movements? So I'm not saying that people shouldn't make Aliyah, but what I am saying is there's a very important role to play in communities and we've got to live with this dichotomy it's a dichotomy and we live with it and we deal with it you made aliyah at 18 correct what drove you at 18 to make aliyah well the truth is i actually didn't make aliyah at 18 i came to study in yeshiva for a year and after one year i was going to go back to south africa and study medicine and after one year in yeshiva i felt it wasn't enough so i stayed a second year then after my second year I said, you know what, one more year, and then I'll go back to South Africa. And in my, in my third year, my parents actually made Aliyah. So for me, it, I basically technically made Aliyah when I was 18, but it was a process. It was a process of being in the gap year in Israel, wanting to stay in Yeshiva another year, feeling more and more connected to Israel. My parents were going to make Aliyah at some point anyway, and then it sort of happened. So I think I came from a very Zionistic family, and I think after... One year in Israel, I felt it wasn't enough, both from a Torah and Israel point of view. And then, and then things happened the way that they happened. And even in the Mizrahi movement, which we're proud to be part of, there's a right, a center, and a left. The, there are those who are passionate in every camp. Where do you think Mizrahi itself, the world movement, are we... Have we, are we leaning more to the right? Are we at the right? Are we leaning more in the center? Are we leaning more towards the left? You know, it's very interesting. Uh, 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 somebody, one of the Rabbonim in Israel publicized a, uh, an interesting document of, not a document, a, a graph of trying to, ca they like, everyone loves categorizing. Yes, I saw that. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, Rabbi Billet sent it to me. I don't know if he sent it to you as well. But, uh, but this, uh, I think it was Avram Stav, Rav David Stav, yes, son of okay. Avram Stav. I don't know if you noticed, there's one woman on that list of all the Rabbanim even. Yes, which is also uh, Petrakovsky, I think. A very interesting list. But here's a list where someone says, okay, here's a list of all the religious Zionist rabbis from, there's, there's ultra-conservative, conservative, center-conservative, center, center-left, center left, and very left, you know. I would say, when I looked at that list, I would love Mizrahi to be exactly in the middle. Because I think ultimately that's where we should be. We should try and be in the religious Zionist camp a broad tent, a broad tent which is not trying to pick the most controversial issues. I don't believe it's Mizrahi's role now to pick the most controversial issues and take a stand in them. Our role is to 
take the values of Torah and Eretz Yisrael, Torah, Am Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, Pitorat Yisrael, Rav Meir Bari Lan's famous phrase, which, which became the, the motto of the Mizrahi movement, and see how it can be a center, inclusive, and a movement which brings together rather than divides. And I'll just add one very interesting thing, Rav Lenny, you know, in the, in the, relig the religious Zionist parties in Israel are very divided. We managed to bring all of them together to work with Mizrahi in the national institutions and all three of them. And, and they don't work together in the political area. So I think there's a role to just to bring people together, uh, which I think is our role. Well, the, I, we're, time is running very quickly and I'm enjoying this very, very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're almost done. So let mm -hmm. me just ask one last question of you, uh, Rev. Paris, and that is where you're at today in Israel, what do you think are the greatest challenges that Israel has and that Mizrahi can help Israel address? I think the greatest challenge facing Israel, in my opinion, is the, the internal divide. We know how amazingly we come together when there's an external threat. You know, it's unbelievable to see. It's just the, there's, there's the unity when there's an external threat. But when there isn't an external threat, I think throughout Jewish history, you know, in a heartbeat, we see in Shlomo's time that uh, one generation later, we split into two kingdoms. I mean, how did that happen? How did a generation after Shlomo, two gen after David, who brings together, we already split? And is this because we as Jews are so passionate and we believe so strongly in things and we are, uh, you know, as Rav Cook says, why are we called Amkshe Orif? Why are we stiff neck? Because people the stiff neck can't look left or right. We only see, we only see the way we want to see. And we've got such a passion for truth that our truth is the only truth. And but we know Shivim Panim La Torah. And I think, I think the, the discourse in Israel is a very harsh discourse. The difference of opinions in Israel, because people feel so strongly about our major challenges, I believe that Mizrahi can and should be both in terms of inside of Israel and in terms of Israel diaspora affairs, a, a, a clear, strong voice putting forward its own values, but at the same time being this Merkaz Ruchani, which can be a voice of bringing together. We all know the challenge that, I think Rav Lichtenstein who said, you want to be passionately moderate, not moderately passionate. When people aim for the middle, you, you can be, moderation is good, but it's also parav. So we don't want to be parav. We want to be absolutely passionate, but can we be passionate people who bring together? Uh, and I think that's a tremendous role. And it's not, a, not an easy role because you don't want to dilute who you are by bringing together. But I think there's a phenomenal role to play for Mizrahi, both in Israel and in the diaspora in this area. Rev. Perez, I want to thank you, but I also want to thank you for that last piece because you are passionate. When you've been to Chicago, when I've seen you anywhere, you are able to communicate the goals, the passion, the love for Eretz Yisrael that Mizrahi represents. It's been an absolute pleasure to be with you for this last half hour, but even more to follow you in your leadership. Yes. And you should continue for many more years. There is so much more for Mizrahi to accomplish. And we look forward to your next trip to Chicago, it should be soon when all of these troubles are over. Thank you so very much. I apologize again for the mistake in times, but it's amazing how we can work with technology. Yeah. The traffic continues to come by you in the window. Thank you. And Thank have you. a very good pleasure. evening, Rav Thank, Thank you. Absolute all. pleasure. Thank you, Rav Thank you. Bye -bye.